glory and the honor in this house. Come on and give God a good praise this evening. Come on. Come on, streaming audience, wherever you are. Come on and give your Lord a wonderful praise. He's been good. Amen. He got you through another day. Hallelujah. Our God is faithful. Hallelujah. Bless the name of God. Amen. How many came ready to receive? tonight from the hand of God. God got something good for you on tonight. Amen. I trust that you came with expectancy. Amen. Because I'm sure God will not disappoint you. Bless the name of God. Look at somebody and ask them, say, did you bring your, bring your praise with you tonight? Come on. Amen. Bless the name of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I think we got a few excited people tonight. Hallelujah. Amen. Bless the name of God. First of all, we're going to go to our God and thank him for a wonderful day. Hallelujah. Father, we bless you tonight. We glorify you. We lift you up, God, because you've been faithful. God, you've never disappointed us, Lord. And God, we thank you tonight for your presence being in our midst even now. And Father, we're praying, God, let glory be in this house this evening in a great and mighty way. We're trusting you, God, that yokes will be destroyed, burdens removed by the power of the living God. God, we're thanking you right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, for transforming lives tonight in the name of Jesus. God, we want to get better. We want to do better. We want to be better. And Lord, we're looking to you, God. Lord, to continue, God, to bring change about in our lives, even on this evening. Father, we thank you tonight for souls being saved from the north, the south, the east, and the west. Father, we thank you tonight in the name of Jesus. Yes, we pray for America. America. America needs you like never before. God, we're praying, God, for a mighty breakthrough for our country. Lord, send revival. God, in the name of Jesus, not only here, God, but all over the world. For the Bible says that if Jesus be lifted up, he will draw all men unto himself. And Father, we thank you right now, God, for everything that you're about to prepare for us. And Father, we pray tonight that you will use the man of God greatly for your glory. Let every word hit its mark and right now God we're not waiting till the battle is over tonight God we're going to start praising you right now we're going to start glorifying you right now we're going to start lifting you up right now in the name of Jesus we believe the walls of division we believe the walls of sickness we believe the walls of battle and unbelief are being broken even now in the mighty and wonderful name of Jesus and God we thank you tonight because you gave us that promise that weeping may endure for a night, but joy, joy, joy is going to come in the morning. So, Father, we thank you right now for everything that you're about to do in us, through us, and for us. In the name that's above every name, that blessed, that powerful, that glorious, wonderful name of Jesus. Come on, saints of God, stream it on us. Put your hands together. Give God a good body praise. Come on. I feel it in the house. I feel it in the house. Come on. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, God, I worship you. I said, Pastor Tommy, you can't wind up tonight. Yeah, I did. Hallelujah. I want you to wind up with me tonight. Give God all that's due here. Bless God. Are you ready tonight, saints of God? Amen. The worship team is ready. And I want you to get with the worship team and let's glorify God on tonight as the worship team comes. We're getting any worshipers in the house tonight? Oh, come on. That's about three of you. Anybody came here tonight to just give God worship and to give him praise? Anybody came here to glorify the name of the Lord? Has God been good to anybody tonight? Come on. Let's worship God together. The Bible says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and enter into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Anybody came with their worship loaded tonight? Come on, let's give him praise tonight as we bless his Hallelujah. name. Hallelujah. Continue to lift up his name for he is worthy of all the glory and he is worthy of all the honor. Use that breath to extol his greatness. Use that breath. Think about how far God has brought you. Hallelujah. Brought you through the pandemic in the name of Jesus. Brought you through sickness and disease. 
brought you through financial catastrophes, somebody ought to open up your mouth and give your God a praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we glorify you. We bless your name. We give you glory, honor, and praise. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just bless your name. Giving you glory, giving you honor, giving you all of the praise. For you alone are worthy. There is nobody like you in all the earth. All powerful, all knowing, and all seeing. Full of grace and mercy and truth. And we acknowledge you, Lord God. And we thank you for dying on a cross for our sins. And from being raised three days later with all power in your hand. So that a sinner like me can come asking, what must I do to be saved? And I thank you, Lord Jesus, for this time. Father, we just invite your spirit to saturate this house tonight. Lord, we pray that you will begin to speak, Lord God, clear your throat and speak a word into our hearts, and we shall be forever grateful. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now, before you take your seats, I want you to tell your neighbor, I got a word for you. I got, I got, a, a, I got a word for you. I got a message for you. And tell them, this week will be miracles, signs, and wonders. Tell them again. Say, this week, there will be miracles, signs, and wonders. Come on, you guys, throw up your face. Say, this week, there will be miracles, signs, and wonders. Does anybody still believe God for miracles? Does anybody still believe God that he is well able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think according to the power that works in me? Does anybody still believe? Somebody tell the devil, I still believe. Yeah, I got cancer, but I still believe. Yeah, I got evicted, but I still believe. Yeah, I don't know where my child is, but I still believe he is a miracle working God. Now, I don't know who that's for, but that thing has been bubbling up in my spirit all week. So if that's you, if that's you, if that's you, if you're watching online and that's you, then just receive it and say, I claim it in the name of Jesus that miracles, signs, and wonders are operating in my life. They are manifesting in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, if you can, take your seats in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. I feel a praise on the inside. I'm about to call Vago and I'm back up here, but... We're going to move on, praise God. Amen, amen, amen. Well, it's good to see everybody here on a Wednesday night, praise God. Let's thank God for our senior pastors, Pastor Jomo and Pastor Charmaine. Hallelujah, and all that they do and all that they invest in us and all of our pastors and to all of our essential workers, praise God. We thank you for each and every one of you. And I just want to celebrate my bride, the lovely Elder Andrea. Thank God for her. One thing about us that you may not know, because uh, Andrea is a very serious person, and most of you probably know she's very serious, but we laugh a lot. We love watching comedy. I mean, we'll watch the Martin Lawrence show for like hours and just be cracking up. Because we love to laugh and we love the joy, and so... I just want to share you a little something about her. That she, she laughs a lot, amen. So we really enjoy life together, praise God. All right, so if you, uh, on the screens, we're going to go ahead and recite our vision. That is the custom of our house. Before we get started, any visitors for the first time? We got any first-time visitors here? Hey, praise God. Thank you for visiting. Yep, we got one in the middle right here and over in the right over here. So if you hold your hands up, our essential workers have a card they want to give you. And if you'll be so kind to get that filled out for us. And then at the end of service, as you'll meet over there by the faith wall, they have a gift they want to share with you. Also, if somebody brought you, bring them too, because we got a little something for them too. Amen? Amen. Praise God. All right. Let's recite the vision of the house. Ready? Go. To equip people with the knowledge of God's word, to empower people to seek God's face in daily prayer, to encounter and be filled with the Holy Spirit to evangelize our community, our county, and our country, to embrace every person in God they love, for God is love for each one to reach one. And if you have your Bibles or your devices or whatever you have to follow along, let's go ahead and make our confession of faith. This is my Bible. I can be what it says I can be. I can do what it says I can do. 
Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. I believe that my life will never be the same after hearing and doing the living Word of God. Amen. Well, we are in Romans 13. Uh, what a just an incredible, incredible book. And Romans 13 has 14 verses. <laughs> I told Mr. Lee said, I don't know what to do with myself, just 14 verses. I mean, this is like a breath of fresh air. So tonight, we're going to spend a little bit more time building a foundation. Right? One of the things that is critical in interpreting Scripture is historical context. So we're going to dig a little deeper today before we just jump into chapter 13. And so uh, I guess the children are being dismissed, right? Okay. Amen. Amen. So we're going to still a, a little bit more time kind of digging a foundation tonight. And I want to start with looking at dispensations because Paul starts off in verses 1 through 7 talking about government. You know, what is the purpose for government? What is our responsibility as it relates to government? But I want to kind of go back in a little bit of historical context. So I have a chart here, and yep, we got it up there. So this is a chart that goes over dispensations, okay? Dispensations and dispensationalism is a theological term, right? You won't find it in the Bible, but it describes how God interacts with humanity, and so I thought it would be a good idea to kind of look at a little bit of context before we jump right in. Now, there are various charts out there. There are some who have maybe four different sessions, up to eight. But the point is not to go over all of it, but I just want to show you a little something here. And let's look at a definition first of all. So a dispensation is a period of time during which God is dealing with human beings according to certain divine goals and human responsibilities. So as time has gone on, God has sort of carved out these time periods throughout history where there are certain interactions that God has. There are certain purposes that God wants to accomplish in the earth, and he has done them through these various dispensations. And some, over, and some kind of bleed over into another, but I want to just have a quick look and say, it, so it starts with the age of innocence. Of course, this is before Adam and Eve sinned. After they sinned, man entered into what is the dispensation of conscience, right? The Bible says they knew that they were naked, they, they were ashamed, and so they were aware, they, were, they became sin conscious. When before, they were just God conscious, but after they sinned, they became sin conscious. And then after the flood enters human government, God instituted human government. And here is the reason why, here is the purpose of human government. After the flood, God stepped back from directly judging the earth until the second coming. Thus, a human agency known as civil government was divinely appointed to restrain evil and protect man from his own sinful nature. Because God knew that if man left to himself, he would go down the same path where God will wipe everybody out again. So what he does by instituting human government is that he puts a restraint on man. He puts a restraint on our sin because he told Noah he's not going to do that again. So in order for God to continue to allow history to progress without his wrath being poured out, he had to put a cap, right? He had to put a guard. He had to put a system in place that allowed man to live within these certain strengths called government so that he can still work out his plan throughout humanity. Amen? And so, human government is what's under known as common grace, right? Common grace is where God blesses everybody. Everybody's able to breathe. Everybody's able to drink water. Everybody has to live a, a, a healthy, a nice life or whatever it is. It is common grace because that's mercy, the fact that God instituted human government. Because without it, we'd have been wilding out. We'd have been just slapped crazy. And God would have gotten tired and his wrath would have gotten poured out again because God only deals with sin only for so much. 
before he has to act out of his righteousness and out of his holiness. So out of his grace and mercy and out of, out of his divine purpose and plan, God institutes human government. Amen? And so it was established by God. It is part of common grace. And I want to jump over to John 17 because as believers, we have a delicate balance between the kingdom of God and, of course, how we live here on earth. And so John 17, verse 4 through 18, this is Jesus praying. And he says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. Just as I am not of the world, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. Because we have a dual citizenship. Once you become a believer in Christ, you are now a part of God's body. You are now a part of God's kingdom. But something amazing happened. When I got saved, I was like, man, I'm still here in the world. Right? Because God doesn't take us out. He saves us protects us from the evil one, and sends us out because we are here to have an influence on the world systems. We are here to have an influence on government, on education, on arts and entertainment, on science. Whatever it is, God has left us here to be a light in the world. We are a light that is on upon a hill. We are the salt of the earth. So we are here to have impact. Tell your neighbors that we are here to have impact for God. We're not here just to sit, but God, he sends us out. He didn't tell us to go in some cave somewhere and wait for the second coming. He says, no, Father, I send them out because we are to have an effect on the world. Amen? So now when Paul gets ready to, to pen this letter to Rome, we have to understand the political background of the day. Because in the known world at the time, in the ancient Near East, there was only one power, and that was Rome. And We've looked at a map before, so I have another map to show you just to kind of give you a perspective of Rome's dominance, all right? I mean, all the way up from what is known as the UK, all the way through Europe, all the way down to the Middle East, all the way down into Northern Africa where Rome had annexed certain parts of the nation. Of course, that includes Jerusalem and Palestine. So Rome was a dominant world power. And when Rome was first instituted, their government, they were a republic, right? Like the U.S. Our government, we are a democratic republic, meaning that the power is with the people or the elected officials. So that's how Rome was established. But it didn't take long before all of the power became invested in one person called Caesar. So Rome now goes from being a republic they go from being a democracy to an uh, autocracy, where one person has all of the power. And so this is the, the situation, this is the historical context in Paul's day. And so I have a list of all the emperors during biblical times. And so it starts off with Augustus. That's who was emperor when Jesus was born. Now, here is where idolatry started when it comes to leaders. Because Augustus, they began emperor worship, right? They began this political idolatry. And then you have Tiberius, he was the one who was there when Jesus uh, ministered and died. Then we have Caligula, and he demanded worship. As a matter of fact, he wanted to have a statue of himself in the Jerusalem temple, but he died before it happened. Right, so we see now we already see conflict here because the Jews were not going to bow down and worship any Roman emperor, right? And so, also as Christianity began to spread, so we already have a conflict between human government and God's people. And then we have Claudius, Claudius actually kicked out all the Jews out of Rome at one point, and then we had Nero. Nero was a psycho, I mean, he was cruel to Christians. He did not like Christians, and he was a persecutor. And then eventually, he would be the one who martyred both Paul and Peter. Now, he was the one who was in charge 
when Paul writes this letter. Nero is the one who is in charge. And then we have Vespian, uh, Vespasian, he is the one who also crushed some revolts because the Jews were constantly revolting against Roman authority. So we've got all kinds of conflict. And plus, Rome had real hard and difficult and oppressive taxation on the people. They had like 10 or 12 different types of taxes. So you have the Jews, you have the Jewish believers, you have Gentile believers, all living in a pagan society, anti-Christian society that they have to live with. And so what does Paul say in chapter 1, of verse 1? Let every person be subject to the governing authority. Stop right there. I mean, that was difficult for them to hear at the time, that they are to be subject to governing authorities. Now, the word subject there is the word submission. Submission is an imperative, meaning it expresses a command. So Paul is giving a command that they are to be in subject, they are to be submission to governing authorities, not to be uh, rebellious, not to be troublemakers, not to storm the capital. Oh, I'm sorry, let me get back to what Paul's saying. So Paul is saying, look, be submitted to human government and not to be the other way around because we are a witness for Christ. And so we see submission is a major theme in Scripture. All through Scripture we see submission. Submission is part of our DNA. It's how God has established us and how we separate, I'll separate ourselves from the world is that we are to be submitted. Children submitted to parents. You're submitted to your boss. You know, husband and wives are submitted to each other. We're submitted to Christ. And so submission is part of the Christian DNA. It's who we are. And so it is this atmosphere that Paul is communicating uh, this letter and so he goes on to say, for there is no authority except from who? God. And those that exist have been instituted by who? God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what? Who? God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. So we see here that God is the one who has instituted governing authorities. And you know what a synonym for instituted is? I thought it was fascinating, inaugurated. So as we see inaugurations and all this, so God is the one who sets up leaders and puts them in place. And we also see here is God's sovereignty. There is only one power, and that's God. It doesn't matter who's in office. It doesn't matter what Putin is doing or Kim Jong-il in North Korea. God is the only power. Now say that with me. Say, God is the only power. Say it again. God is the only power. And we have to know that in these crazy times we live in because it seems like things are going just crazy. And it seems like God's hand is not on us, like he has backed off and he has let the world to do whatever he want, the world wants to do. But no, God is still in control. There is only one source of power, and that is God. And he is sovereign, and he is working behind the scenes. He is working behind the scenes in government. He is working behind the scenes in education. Whatever it is, God is still at work. And we think about it all the time, but do we really get the fact that God is still in control? It's the one thing that gives me peace at night. When I cut the news off and I'm, I get a text report, well, this person got sick and this person died and he had this shooting over here, and I said, God, I just confess you are still in control. I just plead the blood of Jesus over this and the blood of Jesus over that, asking God to go in and have his way to reign and rule because ultimately God has its own purpose and design. And he don't tell us everything. The Bible says the secret things belong to the Lord. And there's some things that God reveals to man, but it's something God has kept in his own heart that we just have to trust and believe. And that's why God's saying, look, if you're a believer, God's got this. I said, God has got this. In the middle of the pandemic, God has got this. And what in the world is monkeypox? But God has got this. I mean, they just come up with the weirdest names for these diseases. Out of the, I mean, but God has got this, and God has got you. Amen? So that's where Paul begins to communicate this letter to the Romans. 
in, in John chapter 19, verse 10, this is Jesus before Pilate because he really emphasizes this point of God's authority and sovereignty. And so Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me? Do you know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Now, evidently, Pilate had no clue who he was talking to. Look at the deception we have amongst our, human, amongst our leaders, where they are arrogant and prideful and think that they have authority. But listen to what Jesus says. So Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who has delivered me over to you has the greatest sin. Look at Jesus telling Pilate, look, you've got no power over me. So whatever's happened to you, I know what it feels like, that your life is going out of control. You have no say in what's going on in your life. But tell me, I'm telling you, God has control of your life. Whatever is happening, God still has authority. He still has the final say. I don't care what the doctor said. God has the final say. I don't care what the court system says. God still has the final say. He still has control. And so Paul and Jesus is saying, but notice, Jesus is about to be crucified, and yet he still submits to the Roman authority. And so we see here that Jesus is our an example because he could have called, the Bible says, 10,000 angels and could have wiped them all out, but yet he is still that example of what it is to be submitted to governing authorities. Now, in verse 3, it says, and this is really the reason for government, for rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who was in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of who? God. And uh, an avenger who carries out whose wrath? On the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection. So just in case you get the first two times, Paul's telling you a third time to be in subjection, not only to avoid whose wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. So Paul is saying here, ideally, you know, we should be good. We should do what the governing authorities have called for us to do. We should obey the laws of the land because in response, the government will treat you well, ideally. Now, we know it ain't always the case, but again, who's in control? God is in control. But in a normal circumstances, if you do what is right, then you are supposed to receive good. Now, we know we got issues with our judicial system. God knows. But still, who's in control? God is in control. And so here he is saying that government is God's servant. That word servant in the Greek is diakonos, is where we get the word deacon. Everybody God puts in power is an ordained office. Because he has put them in power, they are God's servant. They are, whether they even realize it or not, they are still God's servant. He is still the puppet master behind the scenes pulling the strings on humanity. So they do not have autonomy. They are still God's servant. And so this is the reason why we are to be submitted because God is controlling government. And that word swore it means that the governments also have authority even to death. Because we always wonder about the death penalty. Is that, is that a sin? Is, you know, is God against or for that? But God has given government authorities that ability to actually to enact, exact any kind of capital punishment. Amen? So with all that in mind, what is our response to government? And so in verse 6, it says, for because of this, right, because of our submission to government, that government is God's servant. So next time you see that police officer say, hey, Deacon, how you doing, Deacon? You know, so it's an ordained office. They are, it's an ordained office. So for that reason, for because of this, you also pay taxes. Now, wait, Paul, you get a little personal here now. You start, you start digging in my pocket. This is a little personal. 
but you also pay taxes for the authorities are ministers of who? That word ministers, same word in the Greek, it's deacon. Attending to this very thing, pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. So what Paul is teaching Rome, now remember Rome had a very oppressive tax system. He says whatever taxes that is due, pay them. Whatever you are owed, pay it. Now the Jews hated tax collectors. You know, it wasn't like if you wanted to be a tax collector back in this day, you went on LinkedIn and updated your resume and, and went to the website and applied for a tax collector job. If you wanted to be a tax collector back then, it went to the highest bidder. Now, if something goes to the highest bidder, you already know it's going to be corrupt. And Rome, they didn't care what the tax collector collected. Rome just wanted their cut. So if the tax collector you know, paid you know, $10,000 to get the job, guess who's going to charge it? Guess who's going to pay for that? So the tax collector would overtax the Jews, and then they would take the money and keep it. That's why they hated them so much, because they were constantly cheating them. And we see that with Zacchaeus, because when Zacchaeus got delivered, he told Jesus, he says, whoever I cheated, I will pay him back. You know, so here is the atmosphere in which Paul is teaching. They are oppressive with their taxation. Let's take a look at how Jesus dealt with taxes. He does it a couple of times in the gospel. So let's look at Mark chapter 12, verse 13. And he says, And he sent to them some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in this talk. And they came to him and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one and he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Jesus said to them, render to Caesar's the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God. And they marveled at him. Ooh, you know, we're going to see. He, Jesus submitting to Roman authority in an oppressive tax system. Because Jesus knows that if we are in this mode of submission, it's the only way the government will stay stable. Because the Pharisees, they did not, they did not want to pay taxes. And so the Herodians, they say, well, taxes are okay. So they wanted Jesus to take political sides. So, so if the Pharisees, hey, come over to our side, we're going to riot, we're going to storm the, we're going to riot, we're going to storm Rome, we're going to take up, we're not paying taxes no more. Then you had the zealots. The zealots didn't pay nobody taxes. They were terrorists. So Jesus is in this hot political scene, and they're asking him to choose sides. And what does he do? He obeys his own word. He submits to governing authorities. He says, pay what is owed. Pay what is due. And so Jesus is not calling us to be a rebellious people, believers. He is not calling us to riot. He is not calling us to, to start a revolution. Not that our voices can't be heard. That's not the point. The point is we do it up under the law because this is what God is calling Christians to do because who is in control? Amen. If you don't get nothing else tonight, I want you to get it in your heart and in your spirit, no matter what's going on around you, that God is ultimately in control and he is the one source of true power. And we will understand it by and by. In the life to come, we'll get a better revelation of that. And so what we see here is that Jesus himself is honoring the governmental system so that we will have a stable society. Amen? Now, we know that government can be less than ideal. We know that there are issues that come up from time to time that we have to make certain choices about. So is there ever a time where we can say to the government or to the law, I'm not going to obey that? 
right? And so the answer is yes, because Pastor Tommy is a preacher. He knows the word. So the answer is yes. And we have a precedent. Several places in Scripture, but I'll mention one. It is in Exodus chapter 1. Pharaoh had ordered the midwives to kill all of the Hebrew boys, right? Pharaoh, emperor, he's the king, he's the government. Pharaoh says, I want the midwives to go and kill all of the Hebrew boys. And the Bible says the midwives feared God. Because who's in control? That's right, God is in control. And so they didn't do it. As a matter of fact, when they got called on it, they lied. And they said, hey, when we get to the Hebrew women, they done popped them babies out already. We didn't, I mean, they already had them. And the Bible says that God blessed them. So, yes, if there are laws that contradict Scripture, then we are always to choose the side of Scripture because God is the ultimate authority. And the kingdom of God is over every other world kingdom. So we do have precedent, but it's still, we still have to be careful even in doing that. Amen? Because you notice the midwives, they didn't get a rally. They didn't get no picket signs. They didn't go storm the, I mean, they didn't grab, they didn't go into a pharaoh into Egypt. We said, hey, we ain't killing no babies. We ain't killing no babies. No, they just read, they just understood the word. They feared God, and they just didn't do it, and God still honored them. Right? And so there's other places in Scripture that also talk about that. So, I have a quote here, and uh, I love Skip. He's one of my favorite Bible uh, teachers. He says, a Christian is to be a good citizen until being a good citizen means being a bad Christian. Because being a good Christian, walking the precepts and the laws of the Bible is what our mandate is. This is what God is calling us to be and what God is calling us to do. And I thought it was so interesting, and I was so tempted to go into details, but I, my wife said, look, don't get, don't get controversial, don't get controversial. But CNN had an article they posted this week, and the name of the article is, An Imposter Christianity is Threatening American Democracy. You can go look it up and read it yourself. An imposter Christianity is threatening American democracy. And in the article, it talks about a certain brand of Christian, if you want to call them that, who is responsible, actively involved in the January 6th insurrection. And based on what we read, they obviously didn't read, uh, they should have came to Bible study, we'd have, we'd have corrected that. But obviously they didn't read Romans 13, which said this is not what God, this is antithetical to the Word of God. God is not calling us to go in and to commit federal crimes because we're mad about who got elected. We are to be submitted up under authority so that we'll have peace and so that we'll obey God. Because I don't know about you, I don't want God's wrath in my house. I don't want God's wrath on my family. And so we are going to do all that we have been called to do so there will be peace in our nation. Because we are on the brink. We saw just how close we are to utter collapse. Because if God isn't in control, if God is not in control, my God, where would we be? And so here is where we need to stay on our knees and pray. Because what we're seeing is the rebirth of political idolatry. And we got to call that thing down. I said, we've got to call that thing down. Because God is not calling us to idolize any one man. We just, we point to Jesus, we worship him and him only. And so we don't have no total allegiance to one political party or another. We are totally sold out to Christ. So if you are a Republican, you are a Republican light. If you are a Democrat, you ought to be Democrat light. Because all of our heavy uh, adoration and worship and attention goes to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen? So yes, we are involved in the process, but we don't get so absorbed where we just totally lose our mind and ignore what the Bible has instructed us to do. Amen? So next, Paul kind of makes a little bit of a turn here in verse 8, where he says, Oh, no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Now, verse 8 is tied to verse 7. And if you kind of read it at face value, it's not talking about where you're not permitted to borrow, although we should be good stewards, right? We should be good stewards, right? 
All right, Pastor Ty, we got some people need to sign up for financial stewardship. We should be good stewards of our finances. But that's not the point that Paul is making here. Now, most of you know I have a real affinity for the ESV version of the Bible. But whenever I study this out and read other commentaries, the NIV kind of sums it up a lot better. So here's what the NIV says. He says, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. So basically, Paul is saying, pay what you owe, all of it. Pay what you owe, all of it. The only debt we will never fi pay, finish paying is to love each other. The, the debt in terms of loving our neighbor, we will never get through paying. That will be forever. Just like Jesus said in Ephesians, he says, husbands, love your wives as Christ has loved the church. That is an eternal love. That is a sacrificial love. That is a debt we continue to pay and will never get through paying it. So every time you're hunting, you're hunting, hunting do list, just say, well, this is a debt I owe. Let me go ahead and pay. Let me go ahead and pay the debt I owe real quick. Check. That done. Next thing, oh, man, I'm still in debt, Lord Jesus. Let me go do this next thing. Because love, the debt we have when it comes to loving our neighbor, we never get done paying that. Imagine the world we would live in. If every day you got up and saw your neighbor, you saw a debt that you owed to him in terms of how you treated him. And Paul goes into exact detail on how to go about doing that. So in verse 9, he says, for the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor because love is the fulfilling of the law. So that's how we fulfill the law of God is by loving our neighbor. And so that was true in the Old Testament, even when God created the law. It was still about loving our neighbor. And his examples here tell you about how we treat each other, right? So we want to stay kind of in that same vein. And then Paul kind of ends with a call to action. Verse 11 says, besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to awake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us than what we first believed. So Paul says, look, we got to wake up. We can't be spiritually apathetic. We can't be lax with our morals. We need to be on our P's and Q's. We need to have our lights, our candles trimmed and burning. We need to keep coming to Bible study, keep coming to Sunday, keep on praying, keep on worshiping, keep giving, keep serving. So Paul says we need to be attentive because our salvation is closer than we think. Because I talked about in Romans 8 how what we have now is what we call a first fruit of our salvation. We won't get the fullness until we get to the other side. Till we go up yonder, then we will get the fullness of our salvation. Because what we have now is just a down payment. It's just a guarantee of our eventual salvation. So Paul uses this term of a future tense, and he does it in Romans. He always talks about salvation as past, present, and future. And so here we have something to look forward to as we are growing closer and closer to the end. Because I have a question for you. How far away is eternity? I mean, it, it, it seems so far away on the surface. But the reality is, for all of us, even if you're watching online, you are one heartbeat away from eternity. The minute, the last time your heart beats, in a moment, in an instant, in a twinkling of an eye, you will head straight to your eternal destination whether it's with the Lord or whether it's not. So we can't look at eternity like it's some distant thing. We are all of us, one heartbeat, one breath away from eternity. So salvation, it is so near and close to us. Verse 12 says, the night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime. Not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. And so Paul says, look, believers, you still have to be very attentive when it comes to sin. Because it is always lying at the door. It is always around the corner. What does Paul say? He says, when I want to do good, when I try to do good, 
Evil is always present. There's always something lurking. And so Paul is saying, look, if you want to be protected, cast off those things and put on the Lord Jesus. It talks about how intimate our walk should be with him. He should be so close to us. Amen? Now, I want to circle back to Mark chapter 12, chapter 17, because Jesus said to them, he says, render Caesar the things that are Caesar's and the God the things that are God's. So what are the things that are God's? If we're going to render something to God, what exactly is it that we are to render to God? Well, in Psalm 24, it says, the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, and the world, and they that dwell therein. So everything it belongs to God. That means you. You belong to God because He is our Creator. He is our Lord. And we owe God our very lives because we had a debt we couldn't pay called sin. There was nothing we could do to pay that debt off. And so God sent his one and only son into the earth to die on an old rugged cross. And it is on that cross where the Bible says he took on our sin. He who knew no sin became sin for us. And he died on the cross to pay for our sin. He pays for our redemption. He paid for our eternal life. I love what, I love what uh, David said in Psalms 116. He says, what shall I render unto the Lord for his goodness towards me or benefits? He says, I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Because the, the best time to get saved is now. Because we don't have tomorrow's not promised to us. And so when we look at this chapter and all that Paul has talked about here, when he talks about rendering, think about what you render to the Lord. What do you pay? What it is that you owe? Because what we owe is our very life. We owe everything to him. We just got through singing about the very breath we breathe. If it wasn't for God, you wouldn't breathe. If it wasn't for God, your heart wouldn't beat. So we owe God our very lives. We need to give our lives to him so we will live on into eternity. Amen? Because if you had 10 heartbeats left, what would you do with it? If you don't know Jesus and somebody said you have 10 heartbeats, what choice would you make with those last 10 heartbeats? Knowing when it came to an end, you would go into eternity. So 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. You got five heartbeats left. If you don't know Jesus and if you're watching online, what are you going to do with those last five heartbeats, those last five breaths? Four, three, two, one. Because when God closes the books on eternity, on time, it'll be too late. What are you going to do with your life? Amen. So if that's you in this room or if you're watching online, you say, hey, I don't want to be stuck, caught out here with my last heartbeat and end up in a place where I never thought I'd be. And it's not impossible it's not a big thing you have to do. It's just you have to have faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So if you are prepared to give your life to Christ, then just repeat after me. Father, in the name of Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. And today, I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. Come into my heart. Come into my life. Save me. Deliver me. Lord, I repent for all of my sins, and I turn to you, Lord Jesus, for salvation. Holy Spirit, come into my heart, come into my life, and make me and mold me the person you have called me to be, and I will serve you forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Somebody give your God a praise. Hallelujah. If you know where you're going to end up when that last heartbeat happens, give your God a shout of praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. If you know where you're going when that last breath leaves your lungs, thank the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, it is offering time in the sanctuary. Hallelujah. It is an opportunity where we get a chance to give back a portion of what God has given to us. Because we look like we read in, Rome, in, uh, in Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's. So we own nothing. 
Amen. So we're just giving him back a part of what he has given to us. And so you have several ways to give. You can go to our website at lfcc.tv forward slash give. You can text the amount at 84321. Or you can use Cash App. And please remember to use your name or member number in the memo line. Or you can mail it. Uh, or you can leave it you know, at one of the ushers before you leave today's service. Amen. Also, we have a deadline for our Passion for Purity. This is where we are teaching our young ladies how to be women of God. And uh, how many of you know in this day and age that is so very important and how we can raise up godly women. And so the deadline to sign up is August 1st. It's already happening, so they're already having the classes, but it's not too late to get plugged in. Amen. Also, we've got men stepping up coming up on August 20th. So brothers, hallelujah. Good chance for us to come together, iron and sharpening iron. So you can go and sign up for that for 10 weeks, amen. Also, I want to uh, pray for our food before we dismiss. So Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for the food, for the nourishment of our bodies. We thank you for those who had a hand in preparing it. And we just speak a blessing over it right now, Father, in the name of Jesus, amen. Well, I think that's all of our announcements, so let's go ahead and stand to our feet as we recite our closing verse. 1 John 4, 4, which says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. Have a blessed week.